Good evening. It's good to see everyone out this evening. We thank you for being with us uh, tonight. I'm going to go over a few announcements real quick, and then we'll get into our order of services. Um, Sharon Smith is uh, battling stage four breast cancer. Uh, that is the uh, sister-in-law of Dorothy. So please remember her in your prayers, as well as her husband, who's been battling heart issues as well. So please, please pray for them, folks. Um, there's going to be a hymn improvement uh, directly after services. If you want to hang around, it should be for about 10 minutes long. Dwight leads that and always does a really good job to try to get new songs into the mix. Um, those in need of our prayers as well, Jeff Shane, as he's battling cancer. Uh, Nancy Morris, she's been moved to uh, Valley Haven Nursing Home. And Betty Eisenhood, who's also battling cancer in her lung and shoulder. Uh, Carol's husband with the leaky heart valve. And Maggie McGowan, who's uh, been battling breast cancer. Those shut in, Mary Science, Roberta Gilday, and also Sister Jane Ann Fox, who is at the Valley Haven Nursing Home as well. Uh, prayers were requested for Brother Aaron Fleener of the Parkersburg area. I guess he's been having a, quite the time of it. He's lost 15 pounds, been very dehydrated. I guess he had a UTI, didn't even recognize his wife for a little while. I guess it's been really bad. So if you can remember him in your prayers, that would be greatly appreciated. And I guess uh, Carissa Wallace's son, uh, Warren, was not feeling very well earlier as well. See, this evening we're going to have uh, Brother John's going to lead our opening prayer. I'm going to take the uh, songs in place of Dan. Peggy didn't tell me I had to put numbers up, so sorry about getting that up last minute. Uh, scripture reading will be taken from Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Uh, reader this evening will be Griffin Smith. Communion for any who have need will be waited on by Nathan Marshall. And our closing prayer by Brother Don Cohen. seven, please. Number seven, saints lift your voices. There is a light in the kingdom of heaven. No God is equal. No prince is heir. Right. 
October 6, 08, Love of God. This evening comes from Haggai 1, the first 11 verses. I'll be reading from the New International Version. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of jo Josadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you have brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else in the ground produces, on people and the livestock, and on all the labor of your hands.
It's good to be together again this evening. I uh, mentioned this morning, uh, after spending last week away uh, visiting in the Worcester, Ohio area, and uh, we spent each night, Monday through Friday, um, focusing our efforts in uh, trying to evangelize and, and see what good could be done in that area, spreading the gospel. And, and any time, uh, as we mentioned this morning, you get an opportunity to have a concentrated effort like that. I know for me, it just makes my wheels spin, start thinking a little bit and uh, start challenging yourself, examining yourself, thinking just in terms of um, the work that, that we are blessed to do together, uh, going out, that great commission, spreading the gospel. <coughs> And uh, we're, we're so blessed here to have so many opportunities, continue to open doors, keep popping up, and uh, individuals continue to do that great work of inviting, encouraging, spreading out the message. And this is just a, bless, a blessing for us to work together. And so I want to just kind of have some other things that might help us and continue us as we kind of keep our zeal up and think about some things that can help us as we continue to uh, work together in evangelism. And this is one... Uh, I've always heard different sermons on it, and, and, I, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a very uh, 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 introspective thought. There's a verse we're going to look at in Haggai chapter 2. Uh, I, I've never preached a, a sermon on it, but as I kept thinking about it, it just, it's just such a, uh, a really great thought, just a very simple question, and, and it prompts a lot of thinking, and, and it's prompted a lot of thinking on my part. I just want to share a little bit of that. Uh, what was going on in my mind as I started thinking about this uh, question that pops up in Haggai chapter 2. Uh, there, if you're, you're already in the book of Haggai, uh, the reading that was done in chapter 1, just go under, over into chapter 2 and uh, I want to read verse 15. Haggai chapter 2 verse 15 says, But now do consider from this day onward, before one stone was placed on another in the temple of the Lord, from that time when one came to a grain heap of twenty measures, there would be only ten. And when one came to the wine vat to draw fifty measures, there would be only twenty. I smote you and every work of your hands with blasting wind, mildew and hail, yet you did not come back to me, declares the Lord. Do you consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day when the temple of the Lord was founded, consider. And he asks this question in verse 19, and he says, Is the seed still in the barn? Even including the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree, it has not borne fruit. Yet from this day on, I will bless you. Very uh, prompting question, introspective question, certainly, uh, certainly no doubt would prompt a lot of different thoughts on our part as we think about that, but just a, it's an interesting question. And uh, he's, he's really following up on some much needed uh, encouragement and, and uh, trying to uh, give a little bit of a push towards the people at that time to, uh, to, to uh, be more, give more of a concentrated effort in, in terms of the things that the Lord was asking them to do and he asked the question is the seed still in the barn and uh and just three simple thoughts come to my mind whenever i think about that question and think but well if there is seed uh still in the barn why, why might that be and it's an interesting visual it's a visual of obviously the seed uh of us scattering the word and and trying to uh find uh, as many opportunities as possible for others to hear what we are, are so blessed to be a part of and share our faith that's rooted in Jesus Christ because of the gospel. And, uh, and I just thought of just three simple points that um, uh, help me and uh, encourage me, things that I need to probably uh, stay uh, uh, more alert to, uh, to make sure that the seed is getting spread rather than staying in the barn. And one of the first thoughts actually comes from one of the points that was brought up in the first chapter of Haggai, one of the reasons why sometimes I believe the seed stays in the barn is merely just uh, we, we just fail to plan uh, the effort to do it. It, it, it. It's amazing how much our, our schedules uh, fill up. It's amazing how much uh, our, 
even planned uh, uh, things going on in our life. Uh, every day seems like more and more keeps piling on, and as more comes into our life, other things kind of get squeaked out and, and shifted and redirected. And that's one thing I found about my schedule and trying to keep a schedule and trying to be responsible about a schedule is if, if, if you want something uh, to be sure to be done, you almost have to uh, put that down in ink, almost circle it in red so that you're ready whenever unpredictable things start piling up in our day. We say, well, this has to be done. I can't shift this and this has to, has to be uh, rock steady in terms of uh, my intention to get this done. And, and it reminds me of a proverb in Proverbs chapter 21 where he encourages us to do that when it comes to things of God's kingdom, when it comes to things of God's work, that rather than having the mindset, well, I'll just kind of implement this in my day-to-day -day duties. And I, I, I feel uh, I, I easily fall into this category too many times where I think, well, I, I've got certain things going on and uh, uh, you know, i got to remember 10 o'clock, i got to be here and i got an appointment at 11.30 and then 4.30, we got to make sure we have this done. And, I, and so too easy sometimes to say, well, as I'm going through the day, I'll just remind myself and tell myself to just do this. And, and if I have an opportunity, I'll try to, try to squeeze it in there. And you, you know, just as well as I know, some of we say that, have the best of intentions. And, and other unpredictable things pop up through that day that squeeze that out. And I find so many times even when I have the best of intentions, it's something that I know I genuinely want to do, and I want to complete this task. Proverbs 21.5 is a much needed verse I need uh, to, to have, uh, uh, to encourage me to make sure, is the seed staying in my hands, or am I making the effort to make sure it gets where it needs to go? And he, there, and he says there in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 5, he says, uh, the plans of the diligent lead surely to advantage, but everyone who is hasty comes surely to poverty. That, that strikes really hard at home for me. <laughs> Too many times, even again, uh, uh, I, I figure, well, I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just work that in there. And, and I'll tell to myself, and I'll, 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 I'll uh, just kind of make that mental alarm and try to plan it, and, and hopefully that it goes off when it needs to go off. And, and then I'm ready to uh, spring into action and say, yeah, I, I remember I told myself that I was on my way here and I was uh, coming back home and, and getting ready to implement this. I was going to go ahead and throw that in there. And oftentimes that's, that's um, a poor way of uh, ensuring that uh, work gets done. And that's simply what was going on in Haggai chapter 1. Life just got in the way. Uh, plans got in the way. And, and the more that life plans came up and life plans began to be switched and life plans began to be altered and, and, and we're all trying to stay on top of that and kind of stay on top of the wave and balance the whirlwind, whirlwind the things of, of God's uh, business and, and things of his spiritual uh, requirements were getting less and less attended to. And it's so easy for that to happen. And notice we see that if you would go back there to Haggai, and notice uh, it's right there in the reading what we read there in chapter 1. He simply says that they were so busy um, making sure that their paneled houses were getting taken care of. Obviously, if there was a panel on their house they needed replaced, they were replacing those things, they were fixing them, they were, were making sure they operated correctly. As we all have those duties and those responsibilities. But how easily they, 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 they uh, monopolized our time and... and before we know it, uh, we've uh, pushed out time for working on God's house. He says that in Haggai chapter 1, beginning in verse 2. He says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, This people says the time has not come, even the time of the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, but harvest little. You eat, but there is not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there is not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put into a purse with holes. And that, that description, that, that, that convicts me. 
that's when I, I, I definitely need to hear that and to be reminded of. But that description, notice verse 6, you have sown much, but harvest little. You ever feel like that? You feel like, I feel like I, I, I feel like I'm putting so much effort, but like, why is so little coming out of it? And what would happen was in their mind, they, they, they thought they were doing a lot, but what it was was they were trying to squeeze it in and all the other things of life. They're trying to manipulate it, just kind of squeak it in there and we'll fit it in there. But what was happening was they were planning all these other uh, needed things of life, but they had more to do with just their temporary dwelling places. And, they, and, and we know how very easily a to-do list uh, becomes a, a, a monthly project. <laughs> and that monthly project becomes almost months and months of investment and planning and saving to try to make sure we have enough so we can get this project done. And they all need done. We can't just stop life and say, well, I'm just going to live like a hermit and I'm just going to just do God's work and, I, and I'll just pray that uh, ravens will come and feed me like they did with Elijah. <laughs> Obviously, we, we, have to, we have to be busy. We have to be making life plans. We have to be staying on top of those things. But what reminds me is that in addition to those plans, I also probably need to have a, a, a daily planner of these types of things to make sure these also things get done as well. And, and it's so easy sometimes to just kind of say, well, I'll make sure it gets done. I'll, I'll, I'll remember it. I'll, I'll slip it in while I'm uh, going here. And uh, going there, and the end result was it seems like you're, you're moving, but not much is being uh, harvested. So maybe that's something that maybe can help us all is to have a mind, a mind to plan and to dedicate and to uh, uh, prioritize and make sure that life does not push out much needed opportunity and effort to spread the seed. Um, Another point that uh, I began to think about and, and certainly uh, need to be reminded with this is I think sometimes maybe the reason that the seed stays in the barn or remains in the barn. And again, maybe it is that seed is going out, but maybe there's still a, a lot that could go out still. And, and I know for me, that's one thing where it seems like sometimes it's, it's easy to have concentrated efforts and, and, and we have concentrated areas where uh, we're making a, a, a definite attempt with maybe an individual or, or we have a certain topic or a certain uh, concept in mind versus the way that the sower does. And that's always been a, a great challenge for me to try to sow like the sower does because it seemed like his mindset was whether he was at the grocery store, whether he was uh, coming home from work, bumping into someone at the gas station, it didn't matter where he was, it was always time to, to spread it. It, it was just... The mindset was every ground, any ground he was around was ground that needed cover. And, and so I think this may be a good balance that while, yes, we should probably have a, a planned method of attack, a planned method of how we're going to accomplish these things, but we also may be planning uh, to be able to be ready at any time to spread the seed. And when we go over to Matthew chapter 13, that's the concept that we see of the sower. And that's what made him so successful is that in his mind, he pretty much told himself, I plan to sow the seed wherever I am, whether it was good ground, whether it was on the side of the road, <laughs> uh, whether it was stony ground. He didn't really even think about it. It was just wherever I am, I'm going to make sure I've got seed in my hand and, and, and just <laughs> scatter it. And that's something I know I can do a much better job of maybe saying, planning in my head, well, make sure I have maybe uh, a CD or maybe a, a pamphlet, a track, something that I know that even though, though I may not have the, the time and uh, to maybe go into a great uh, dissertation or, 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 or all about Bible study with someone, just to, to know that in passing I can maybe mention something or pass something along. And that's always been a, a challenge for me to try to develop that mindset to say, I want to plan and to be the kind of person that just wants to get the seat out wherever I am and to whomever uh, I'm around. But notice it says in Matthew chapter 13, uh, that was the encouraging picture of how he went about doing that work. It says in Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 18, it says, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. 
This is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. And just the fact that he sowed seed on the road tells me that he didn't have that kind of narrowed, concentrated effort method, methodology because it was mindset, the mindset was, well, here's a road, uh, here's where I'm standing, and here's where seed's going to go. Wherever he was. And, and granted, yes, maybe there wasn't a whole lot that was done initially. Uh, it says that Satan immediately snatched that seed away. And I know that's for me, and I'm going to get to that, that third point. helps me with this, but I think that's why I, I, I need to uh, work on a lot more. Is just having that more optimistic mindset that no matter where I am, it's a good opportunity. Even if, even if right away, almost it doesn't, doesn't maybe pan out to be a good opportunity. It doesn't seem like a good opportunity because it seems like immediately when we took a, the opportunity to say something, we just either had a door slammed or someone immediately just said, I'm not interested at all. Oh. But I find it interesting that he covered ground where Satan would easily snatch it up. And so that's a great picture. It says in verse 20, the one on whom seed was sown in the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of the wealth choke the word. And it becomes unfruitful. And the one on whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So ultimately, maybe, sometimes maybe the reason why maybe in a personal level, why maybe it's still in my house, and maybe still in my hand, maybe still plenty of seed to go around, is because I'm just not... Uh, implementing this kind of a strat strategy to have the mindset anywhere is an opportunity and wherever, um, no matter what that ground looks like, it's an opportunity for me and for uh, anyone to scatter and uh, to just let God do the rest. And that brings me to the, the third point. I think sometimes maybe the reason why there's still seed in the barn is because maybe just we need to boost our own level of faith that it's possible to do things that we don't, we aren't able to see it doing. In other words, it's able to reach those that we often uh, can't comprehend how it could reach them. Uh, don't understand how it works. Don't understand how the process of how they sift through it in their own mind and the wrestling match that takes place in their hearts. We don't see any of that. And even if somebody, uh, maybe right off the, the, the bat, right, you know, it, it almost gives us the impression they're not interested, gives us the impression. I don't want anything to do with this. Uh, we all know people uh, uh, say all kinds of things uh, at face value, but what's going on beneath the surface sometimes can be a little bit different. And to have the confidence and the trust that maybe, maybe God is able to do something with this, even though they're giving the inclination that they don't seem uh, uh, that, that, that much is going to happen. But again, I'll go over uh, back to Habakkuk and the reason that he asked the question, and I find this encouraging, the reason he asked the question, is there seed in the barn, is because the answer was no. There wasn't seed in the barn. They repented. Uh, Habakkuk was able to encourage them to change. They had a different work ethic. In the beginning, yes, they were, they were a little bit misguided. They were focused on things, and they weren't taking... Uh, all the opportunities to really put forth that effort to sow. But I love that, that there's a change that takes place in the second chapter. Back to go over there and read, and we find why this change took place and becomes a great encouragement for all of us uh, to follow their mindset. What changed? Well, we're going to see, there we go back to Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2. I'm oh, sorry, uh, uh, Haggai, I'm sorry, I keep saying Habakkuk. Haggai, there's too many H's. Haggai, Haggai. <laughs> uh, Haggai chapter 2. Um, listen to what he says. Um, there in verse 19, he says, Is the seed still in the barn? Notice he continues. Even 
including the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree, it has not borne fruit, yet from this day on, I will bless you. In other words, everything from an agricultural standpoint was saying this is not a good time to harvest. Nothing was growing. Everything was desolate. And, and he makes this rhetorical question saying, hey, is the seed still in the barn? In other words, is there, is there anything left to sow? No, and it wouldn't really be an opportunity because there's, there, there really was no, no other place for the seed to go. And what he is encouraging them is saying, but, but I don't want you to get pessimistic. I don't want you to lose confidence. I want you to realize that even though everything on the surface and everything on the horizon looks like nothing could possibly grow here, he says, I'm encouraged that you did let the seed out of the barn because he says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your effort fruitful. I love that. In the beginning, they were pessimistic. They, 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 they allowed too many things to cloud their thinking, and maybe rightly so. Maybe they didn't trust it, that it was worth the effort. Didn't trust, well, why would I go through this effort when it doesn't seem like maybe much good can be done? And after being prompted by Haggai to change that thinking, they then moved to a level of faith, and he asked this rhetorical question. I love it. He's, he's almost saying, and Curtis, look at the great work. Is there any seed left? Can, can we do any more? Like, you, guys, you guys did a great job. You guys threw it all out. And, and look, it looks like on the surface, like that was a wasted effort. Don't think that. I will bless you. And I want to go over to, uh, now we go over to Habakkuk. Yeah, now, we're time, now it's time for Habakkuk. Uh, go to Habakkuk. And uh, I love what he says in chapter 2. Listen to what he says in Habakkuk chapter 2. In verse 3, I think this is a great passage for us when we're trying to boost our own faith and the efforts we put forth and trust that God can produce them. Right? In verse 3, he says, For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens toward the goal and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it. You hear that? I, I, I always love maybe, you know, you, we're, you see that you know, maybe we're watching a, a video. Someone say, hey, I want to show you this video. And then you're, you're, you know, someone's watching like, I, what is it? Wait for it. <laughs> Wait for it. <laughs> I'm trying, trying, hang in there. It's going to be worth it. And I love how he, he uses that same language. He's saying, I know right off the bat, it doesn't seem like anything amazing. He's saying, Wait for it. Wait for it. <laughs> hang in there. Keep being faithful. Keep investing. Keep, keep doing what you're supposed to do. Notice, though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come. It will not delay. And that was the message of Haggai to the people then. Of basically saying, God is going to, I'm going to reward you. Because you did. You trusted. Even though everything else said, I don't see how much good could happen. It doesn't look like anything else is really growing but what's the difference this was not physical seed this was spiritual seed and spiritual seed is able to go places that the physical seed where it's limited the spiritual seed can go even deeper and go to places that maybe we don't even recognize uh, the possibility uh, at all but uh, one, one final passage I want to look at and it's in uh, Mark chapter 4 Ultimately, I think if we can have that mindset that uh, we're, we're, we're going to take advantage of every opportunity to make sure seed goes out, uh, make sure that um, we make plans for it to happen, uh, utilize the opportunity, and prayerfully trust God. Here's, here's where we can be when we are waiting for it. Here's something that Jesus encouraged his disciples to do while they were waiting for their efforts um, to show some good results. In Mark chapter 4, verse 26... He says, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. And he goes to bed at night and gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows. How? He himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, then the mature grain and the head. But when the crop permits, 
He immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And initially, in the Corinthian letter, that's essentially what Paul, remember, he says, he says, well, he says, as far as the physical labor we do, we, we obey God, we trust God, and we plant the seed. Somebody else comes along and helps a little bit in waters, the soil, world. Other than that, he says, we really don't know how the rest of it works because the rest of it is God's work. He says, God gives the increase. God is the one working on their hearts, and God is the one using all these, the power of the word to work upon them. So what a great opportunity uh, for us to look at this example, uh, see how um, if we ever find ourselves in a place where maybe we feel maybe we're getting a little sluggish, or maybe we feel maybe there's more seed, and maybe wonder why is the seed still here? Um, we can make those changes that uh, Haggai saw his people made. Maybe it's just a matter of making definite plans to make sure we follow through, uh, utilizing the opportunities and having the faith and the trust that it's worthwhile because God will give the increase. So if you're with us here this evening, I've never obeyed the, the gospel itself. Uh, we are so happy and uh, thrilled you're here. And that's why we simply are putting our faith at work to trust that putting forth the seed this evening is a worthwhile effort. Uh, we believe that just as Paul said, the, the power is in the gospel, and it has the power to bring that salvation that is necessary in all of our lives. Very quickly, I want to read that passage in Romans, uh, Romans chapter 1, where Paul talks about what was it that motivated him to constantly utilize opportunities to preach. He says he had to have faith in the ability that the word had uh, to change sinners, to bring them to God. And he says in Romans chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 14, he says, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. And we pray and hope that if, uh, the uh, image and, and the revelation of God's love through Jesus, his willingness to die upon a cross, he shed his blood because he loved you. He loved us all, all and had so much hope and optimism that we would be so moved by that love that we would then ask the next question, well, what shall we do? And the answer given very plainly, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. And anyone who wishes to obey those simple commands can be baptized this very evening to rise up to walk in newness of life and to live faithfully for him and hopefully also join in that effort of spreading that seed to others who also need it. But won't you accept uh, the terms of the gospel and be saved while we have an opportunity? Won't you come to the front? We'll gladly assist and help you while we stand and sing the song of encouragement. I have decided to follow
Doth he not leave the ninety and nine and go into the mountains to seek at that which has gone away? It's Matthew chapter 18. There are ninety and nine that say, not able to make it out here this morning to take the Lord's Supper. We were talking about the Lord's, the, la- the Last Supper before uh, in kids class this morning and just talking to the kids and how, you know, we're talking about Judas and how close Judas was with Jesus and we were drawing the faces on, I always draw the faces on like little characters I draw and we were drawing like Jesus. Uh, most of them were happy except for Judas who was with like slanty eyes and he was angry and we were talking about that and how the devil had kind of taken control of him and Jesus we put like just a regular muted face and uh, it's interesting to think about like what his face would have been like would it have been happy would it have been sad would it have been probably pensive I would like to think it would have probably been a very pensive uh, motivated uh, face because he understood what he had to do He was not excited about it, I don't think, by any means. And people don't realize how close he got together with those apostles and his disciples. And he had friends on this earth. And I'm sure he wasn't ready to leave them either. But he also understood that every single person in here and the millions and billions of people before us, he sacrificed himself for us. And he knew what his goal was. And he knew that it was close. And then when he died on that cross, what did he say at the very end? It is finished. That's why I think he was more pensive. That's why I think he was more motivated looking than anything else. Something to think about how human he was. Sometimes we just make him so two-dimensional and we just try to say that he wasn't a human, but he was. And he had very human feelings and emotions and very human thoughts, just like you and I. 
And uh, let's give thanks for that man that was perfect now. Dear Lord, we come to you giving thanks for this bread which represents your son's body, represents the perfect life that he lived, perfect sacrifice that he made on the cross, Lord. We're so appreciative. We're so thankful for that sacrifice. And we're so thankful for these ones who are able to make it out tonight to partake of the Lord's Supper as you have commanded on the first day of the week to remember that. This is a hopefully motivates us throughout the week, Lord, and hopefully it'll motivate us now to just re-energize us and refocus ourselves on the cross and less on ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, we come back to you in prayer, thanking you for this fruit of the vine, which represents your son's blood. Lord, there's so many representations of that blood, but Lord, let us remember that it did fuel his veins and made him human, and it was also shed on that cross. It was shed as he was beat and slapped and, and uh, just whipped, uh, as he put the fat crown of thorns on his head. The blood made him human, just amongst other, every other thing, Lord. He was a real person. He was a real human. And he was really perfect. Let us never forget that. As we partake of this fruit of the vine, let us remember that now. In Jesus' name, amen. the Lord's Supper. And these ones are also commanded on the first day of the week to give back of themselves. Uh, this is something we do financially uh, on Sundays, but we also should be giving of ourselves throughout the week and always to God as Brother Daniel preached about tonight. So let's give thanks for that. Lord, thank you so much for our uh, physical abilities. Thank you so much for our mental abilities to, uh, as Brother Daniel preached about spreading the seed. Uh, wherever we go, Lord, we should be an example in whatever walk of life we are. And that's what should make us happy in this earth because we know that our grand purpose can be uh, done through even the darkest, dingiest circumstances, Lord, and that that seed will grow when planted correctly, Lord. Let us continue to be motivated. Uh, let us continue to uh, be thankful, Lord, as we are so quick to be. I uh, want more and more and more in this country, Lord. Let us realize that the only thing we should need more of is you and we should be thankful for that at all points lord uh, thank you so much for our finances and the things we have the roots over our head our clothing all the things that we have that we take for granted lord let us not take those for granted let us realize how many blessings we have and count them daily lord in jesus name amen Good. It's good to see everyone out this evening. We thank you for being with us, uh, those visiting with us, those recently restored, those we haven't seen in some time. It's just a great crowd tonight. We appreciate you being here with us. It's good to see Dan back with us as well. We appreciate all his efforts. Is there anything that needs to be announced this time, Nathan? Well, your animals are traveling. Eh, yeah, let me do it. <laughs> whatever. If you want to pray for me, you can. If not, whatever. Uh, <laughs> they're making their way back from Texas, so remember them as well. We'll, have, uh, we'll sing the last stanza of 202, and we'll be dismissed by Brother Donnie. Also, we're going to have a hymn improvement uh, real quick. If you guys want to make your way forward fairly quick, we can get that 10 minutes in and get you along your way for Wrestle's Kids. Not going to mention any names. <laughs> Griffin, sorry, buddy. Uh, Dad's work is mom sits father and has a cold, too. So. Oh, goodness. Okay. Tiffany has a, a cold and her his father, and then uh, his dad's working, so remember them as well, guys. Okay, if you want to go ahead and stand, we'll sing the last stanza of 202. Okay. Yeah, buddy. Right. I'm sorry. Okay, great. She's in pretty good spirits. She's really happy to see us. Okay. And um, she, she said she feels useless because she encouraged her that, you know, she thinks she was good even there sure. with the other kids and lifting them up and, you know, talking to them and stuff. And she, her last words were, 
That's good. Yeah, please remember Nancy. It's got to be very lonely in the midst of, especially with COVID, but in general being in a nursing home. Send some, send some cards, visits, calls. It means the world to those folks. Please remember them, guys. 202. Go ahead and sing 202, last stanza. Beyond this land of waiting, seeking, and sighing, far beyond the sorrows, darkening this, and far beyond the pain and sickness and dying, lies the summer land of bliss. Land beyond, so fair and bright, land beyond.